Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to have a look at another collaboration beer. So this one is half Scottish on the home side, half Swedish on the away side. Both of the breweries involved in this one have featured on the channel before and I've had some really nice beers from them over the years. I've also reviewed a collaboration involving these guys as well, which was also very good. So I have to say I'm quite curious to see how this one turns out. Now the particular beer that we're having a look at today is a that I would more associate with the Swedish brewery rather than the Scottish brewery. So uh, yeah, I think it will be quite an interesting one because it's a style that the Scottish brewery have been experimenting a, more, a little bit more with in recent times. So let's see how we get on with this one then. Hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review and I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. So uh, yeah, for the home brewery then, we are going to head up toward Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland where I used to study chemistry of course. We're going to go to the northwest of the city to Dice and that means that we're having a look at another beer from Fierce Beer. So this one is part of their fifth birthday releases. It's number six and it is called the Emergency Haze. It comes in at 10% ABV. It's a New England hazy, whatever you want to call it, triple IPA, and it's brewed in collaboration with Dewey's Brewery, who are from Landvetter, just to the west of Gothenburg, Utebori, on the Swedish West Coast. So uh, yeah, Dugas Brewery, one of my favourite Swedish breweries. These guys do a lot of different beers, lots of big imperial stouts, uh, but in recent times they've been doing a lot of hazy New England IPAs as well. When it comes to Fierce Beer, if people were to ask me about Fierce Beer, I would say that the best beers that I've had from those guys have also been the big barrel aged uh, imperial stouts and imperial porters and things. But I have noticed that Fierce have been doing a few more kind of sessionable beers in recent times, like New England IPAs, West Coast IPAs, Pilsners and stuff like that and those have actually been pretty nice in fact but this is a beer that I picked up at the Fierce Bar uh, during my recent visit there where I filmed my video so uh, yeah this should be a really interesting one when I saw that this was a Dugas collaboration I just had to get this but the last collaboration I had involving these guys was a good few years ago it was a Scotch ale called We, Fier we, we Fierce Dugas and I think that was back in about 2017 or something if I remember correctly but uh, yeah nice to do another collaboration involving both of these breweries one of my favourite Scottish breweries and one of my favourite Swedish breweries as well so uh, yeah let's get cracking then so as always with my reviews, I'll tell you a little bit about both the breweries involved here before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery websites, the link to my other reviews that I've done, both from Fierce Beer and from Dugas Brewery, and we will no doubt add more to both of those lists at some point in the near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel, of course, has a geography-based tagging system, so you you can go into the home page and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, province, prefetch, or whatever it is you happen to be interested in. Do check out the playlists of beers from different countries. There is one there for all the Scottish beers I've reviewed for you and another one for all the Swedish beers. Those lists are added to at different rates because obviously I kind of spend my time between both countries these days. So just take it as it comes. But as always, please do get in touch and let me know some other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely, hugely appreciated. So anyway, to tell you a little bit about the breweries then, and we'll kick off with Fierce Beer since they are the home brewery in this case. So Fierce Beer, as I've mentioned to you already, are based in Dice to the northwest of Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland, and they began life as the home brewing experiments of David Grant, who had worked for many years in the oil industry. So he'd been home brewing since since about March of 2013 and after hosting a beer and food pairing dinner in May of 2015 where his beer happened to receive rave reviews from those attending he decided that he wanted to kind of take it to the next stage and turn professional. So David is joined at the brewery by Dave McGarry who also worked in the oil industry for quite a long time but he used his redundancy package during the oil price crash to put himself on a brewing course at Brew Lab down in Sunderland in the northeast of England. So they teamed up and then in April of 2016, they moved into the brewery in the Kirkhill Industrial Estate in Dice to the northwest of Aberdeen. And at the moment, these guys can brew around 800,000 litres of beer per year. They are still expanding, from what I understand, and adding to their fermentation capacity. So that will no doubt keep growing over the next uh, 
next few years and they started canning their beers in early 2018 and they now have their own bar on Exchequer Row which is called the Fierce Bar and you'll find that just next to Brewdog, Castlegate and the, uh, the View Cinema so do make sure you go and check it out and you can also have a little look at my out and about video that I did there and I filmed that just a couple of weeks before this review actually but these days they're looking to move to a more kind of central location in Aberdeen and have like a city brewery brew pub kind of thing so we'll see how that goes over the next few years and in May of 2019 they opened a new bar on Rose Street in Edinburgh and they also have one down in Manchester in England these days as well actually so lots of exciting things going on for Fierce Beer at the moment and I do hope they manage to get their new brewery location in central Aberdeen at some stage because they are a pretty damn solid brewery. So as I said to you earlier my favourite beers that I've had from these guys over the years have been the big Imperial Stouts you know Very Big Moose is a good one Um, the Cafe Racer is a little bit of a classic as well so they're very good at the dark beers in my experience. They always used to have some really good kind of fruity sours as well but in recent times they have been experimenting a little bit more with the kind of sessionable things you know the West Coasters, the um, New England IPAs and also a few laggers as well which is which have been very interesting they're also associated with the New Zealand Beer Collective as well which imports a lot of different New Zealand beers over here to Scotland so uh, yeah it is definitely worth uh, visiting the Fierce Beer Bars for that and they've also got their own range of sour beers as well which is called Fierce by Nature and you will see one of those appear on the channel in a fairly a, a fairly um, not recent a fairly soon or fairly upcoming should we say in an upcoming video that won't be too far away we'll say that brain's not working in english these days but yeah that is all i can really tell you about fierce beer for the moment if you want to learn more about these guys you can check out the brewery website follow them on facebook and instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on and you can also check out the rate beer untapped and beer advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all of the different beers that these guys have done so um yeah let's get on and have a little read about Dugas Brewery then on to the Swedish side of things so uh, Dugas Brewery as I've mentioned to you already are based in Landvetter which is on the eastern outskirts of Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast or Jutebori as we would say in Swedish but the brewery was established back in 2005 in Nolendal to the south of the city by Mikael Engström Duge whom of course it takes its name from but a few years prior to this Mikael had met an Englishman who was selling second-hand breweries uh, around Europe and this got Mikael thinking about brewing his own beer so he studied the admittedly very complex Swedish alcohol laws visited various breweries around the country and started buying up equipment to put together his own brewery and this culminated with the opening of the first facility in Milndal back in 2005. Their beer went down very well, they very quickly grew and they outgrew their premises relatively fast actually and by 2009 uh, they had to start looking at moving so the following year in 2010 they moved up to Landvetter near the Gothenburg airport. But the older brewery had a capacity of 1,500 hectolitres per year at maximum, but the new brewery started off with a capacity of 8,000 hectolitres per year, and this has more than doubled in recent years, and they are constantly expanding from what I understand. Uh, but over the years, the brewery have become well known for a lot of different styles. In the early days, they were known mainly for their kind of juicy, fruity sours. If you like, the uh, Tropic Thunder is a very well-known beer, a collaboration with uh, Stillwater and Artisanal from the US, that's one that you really need to try. But they were also very well known for their Imperial Stouts as well, particularly the Idiot, which uh, is a bit of a beast and I think you need to try. We'd love to see them re-release the original uh, Idiot recipe because it's known as the Big Idiot uh, these days. But yeah, that's another one to check out. They were for a stage known as uh, Dugas Ull or Porter Brewery, if I remember correctly. But these days they've been experimenting with a lot of, uh, of different things. So they've got the Fresh and the Crush series, which are the New England and New England double IPAs. They've got the Bite series, which are the West Coast IPAs. Um, they've got another series which is uh, different kinds of wheat beer. They have the Future series, which is the Barley side of things. They've got the Mega, which is the, um, the, the really heavy Imperial Stouts, the 15% plus ones. Those are monsters. They've got the single fruit series. They're just doing a whole host of uh, different things. But they're also one of the co-owners of the two brewers beer bars in Gothenburg. They own those along with All In Brewing. And I believe that uh, Electric Nurse also have a share in those as well. And Electric Nurse is a brewery run by uh, Mikael's daughter, Ida, and her husband, John. And they are also worth checking out if you get the chance. They brew a number of the beers at uh, Dugas Brewery as well, actually. But um, yeah, that is all I can really tell you about Dugas Brewery. One of the most respected names in Swedish craft beer, and that is a reputation they have quite rightly earned in my experience. So if you get the chance, have a go at the Tropic Thunder 
and the Big Egypt or any other beers. They're also very good at coffee stouts, one of the best coffee stout producers in the world in my experience. But yeah, that's all I can tell you about them for the moment. If you want to learn more, again, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So uh, yeah, let's get on and actually have a taste of this beer then and see how we go. So before we do that, I'll just let you have a little look at the artwork on this one before we open up. As you can see, this is one of these ones that the camera is gonna hate just because it's all shiny. But there you can see the Fierce Beer uh, symbol there. And it's a special one for five years. There you can see one of the Dugas Brewery symbols as well. You can see, um, is it going to zoom? No. The fifth birthday edition number six. And then you can see Emergency Haze. So um, yeah, it says on the back here, Emergency Haze, brewed with our Swedish pals at Dugas. This super hazy and juicy triple IPA has been smashed with Azaka, Kashmir and Brew One Hops. Big and full bodied with a sweet tropical hop hit. It is a, a, in case of emergency, please don't break the glass. So yeah, that was what I was going to come on to next. As I said earlier, this one is a 10%. Uh, triple New England IPA and uh, all of the hops in this one we have encountered before and I believe all three are American so uh, Azaka comes in about 14% alpha acid it gives you a lovely big kind of orangey and pineapple kind of note it's more like a mandarin orange that you get out of that cashmere is a really interesting one lots of melon and lemon lime actually coming out of it again 14% alpha acid and brew one I think is also 14% alpha acid and that comes in uh, with a lot of pineapple from what I remember too so this should be quite interesting but um, it also has a little bit about their five year anniversary here as well so it says five years 1826 days from our first brews in a tiny unit to winning multiple awards at last year's Scottish Beer Awards it's been quite a journey so to celebrate our fifth birthday we've brewed six extremely special edition beers this is number six brewed along with our good friends at Dugas so uh, yeah I think I have one more of these actually because there was really just two that kind of caught my fancy some of the other ones sounded really kind of unusual and things but you know there was there was just two of them that caught my fancy to be honest with you and when it's a Dugas beer I love Dugas Brewery as well as Fierce Beer so I thought this is one that we have to do but um, yeah 10% ABV as we said 440 milliliter can I think I paid about eight pounds for this one if memory serves me correctly um, when I was at the bar I didn't actually spend that much at the bar I got two cans that were roughly about eight pounds or something like that and then I think in total I paid about 32 but eight pounds roughly translates to somewhere in the region of like nine about nine euros fifty maybe so 95 Swedish kroner uh, and probably somewhere in the region of like ten dollars fifty American something like that but you know I just kind of said you know fuck it with this one and went for it but uh, yeah let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the taste and then I'm really curious to see what this has in store for us. And also a very happy birthday to Fierce Beer as well. So let's get this guy out into the glass and just see how we go. So I think this should be very nice. As I said, this is a style that I more associate with Dugas Brewery than uh, Fierce Beer, of course. But I think it will be pretty good when you consider the quality of beer that both breweries have put out there so that is up to the two-thirds pint mark so I think we've got most of it into the the glass at the moment let me just line it up again so it looks nice for the video but um yeah this looks pretty interesting so before the head disappears you can see that it's poured with somewhere between a half and a two-third finger of a frothy I would say kind of creamy very slightly beige colored head actually it does have a little bit of a kind of beigey note to it in terms of the colour but you can see the bubbles there are very kind of thin and foamy but some more bumpy bubbles just kind of sitting on top of it if we shine the light through this beer it is pretty damn opaque and you can see it actually has I think it appears let me just put my hand behind this I'm not sure you're seeing exactly what the colours um like on the camera to be honest with you because I think the light's reflecting off it a bit but to me on the naked eye it's actually got this really deep murky um kind of amber sort of medium amber color to it it's really unusual but to you guys it's looking a little bit more kind of bright so um yeah as i always say i like comparing the new england ipas to different fruit juices and this really just reminds me of a kind of mixed 
tropical fruit juice. It's got that sort of dark orangey amber kind of thing to it. Now remember, the colour of your beer depends on one, the type of malts that you use. That determines the, the magnitude of the colour, the EBC in other words. Uh, the length of your wort boil is also going to play a role. The longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar is caramelised, thus you get a darker colour of beer. A New England IP like this will probably undergo a wort boil of between 70 to 90 minutes. But um, yeah, I don't think barrel aging or adjuncts is really going to play a role in this one as it might do with sour beers. But the level of haze on this one is pretty impressive. It is one of the superior and gloopier ones that I can think of that I've seen over the last little while. But when it's 10%, you would expect that. And remember, the level of haze depends on the oak content, the wheat content and the yeast. And just looking at the ingredients, um, yeah, this has got all three in it. Barley malt, oat malt and wheat malt. So it looks... Very good actually this one. For a New England triple IPA, nothing really untoward with the um with the appearance of this beer. So uh, yeah, let's take a closer look at the aroma then and see how we get on. You can see the head has faded away in this one, but when it's 10%, I tend to find with the higher alcohol beers, the head doesn't hang around as long. But let's just have a little look at this then. Aroma. Let's see for it. Let's go for it. Ooh. <laughs> now that's an unusual aroma for uh, a New England IPA. Um, see, to be honest with you, it's really strange. The aroma of this, the first thing that comes out of the glass, it's like a, you know, fresh cut grassy sort of thing and a wee bit of this syrupy candy underneath. I'm really not sure what to think of this one. Um, even when I sugar it up a little bit, even when I sugar it up a little bit, it just actually smells like grass. That's really weird. Um, yeah, the aroma out of this one is, is really, really unusual, actually. Um, hmm, I'm wondering about this because the colour of this, as we say, is a little bit unusual. So I'm just hoping there's nothing going on like the, with the likes of oxidation or something like this with this beer. Because um, that would be really unfortunate, to be honest with you. I got all excited about this collaboration. But this is strange. You know, it smells a little bit like pander violets and for those of you watching abroad it's this really it's this purple sweet that you get and when you put it on your tongue it turns into this kind of really sweet powdery sort of thing it's almost a little bit like skittles it's got a similar taste if you put all the skittles together it's kind of like that uh, but this beer smells like a mix of grass like freshly cut wet grass and skittles it's there's not much else coming out of it other than that um maybe my nose is playing tricks on me which is always a possibility, but when I sugar it up, in fairness, I do get a little bit of a kind of white bready sort of thing to it. I can smell a little bit of oaty, creamy character in there. But other than that, yeah, that's weird because you would normally expect a little bit of a kind of Werther's original brown sugary sort of thing. Um, yeah. And it's some, I think it's something with the yeast of the malt base in this that's a little bit unusual. Yeah, but it's, I don't know about that. That's really, really unusual. I don't know if there's going to be like some kind of sour IPA or something like that. But yeah, let's try and see if we can pick any fruits out of it. And in terms of green component, maybe there's a little touch of earthiness, a bit of floral aromaticity, but really wet, freshly cut grass. The malt base is really hard to, uh, to pick out in this one. So on the fruity side of things... Yeah, it's like this candy, lime, apple -y sort of thing, like the green skittle. It's like that. Um, yeah, and I mean, we've got Azaka, which is going to give you a sort of tangerine note. We've got Brew One, which is pineapple. And then we've got Cashmere, which gives you this really unusual, you know, melony, lemon, limey sort of thing. So for me, it actually smells quite, it's got this sort of candy apple sort of thing to it. There is a wee bit of that melony quality from the Azaka, uh, from the, the, the cashmere for sure. You are getting that. And it really, it's a very, it's really just a kind of unusual candied quality that you get from this beer. The aroma on this is really, really pretty fucking weird, to be honest with you, compared to um, other beers that I've had before. It smells pretty much like Skittles and a bit of grass. <laughs> um, even when I sugar this up and try to get more out of it, there's just not really a lot kind of forthcoming. You do get a bit of that oaty creaminess, maybe a little bit of Werther's original butter candy, 
but yeah it's grass all the way the sort of candy apple limey sort of thing that you'll get from from green skittles actually uh green tic tacs maybe as well it's something like that that's going on in this one so maybe a wee bit of a yeah as i say candy apple a bit of lime a bit of melon maybe a wee bit of pineapple or something behind that um yeah i'm really really not sure what to make of this uh I'm really not sure what to make of that aroma. Um, I think we should just have a taste of this and see how we go. I'm really hoping that there hasn't been something with oxidation or whatever in this. And, you know, when you see a colour like this on a beer, a kind of big murky colour like this, it does make me a wee bit kind of suspicious or whatever. But let's just have a taste of it and see how we go. So this one is the Emergency Haze, the sixth in the series of six Birthday releases for Fierce Beer's fifth birthday. Uh, 10% New England Triple IPA brewed in collaboration with Doogie's Brewery from Landvetter near Gothenburg, Utebori on the Swedish West Coast. Let's have a taste of this one and see how we go because the aroma of this is pretty damn weird for a New England Triple. But let's have a go. Slanja, Skull and cheers. <clears throat> Mm. yeah that's a really i'm going to say straight away it is a nice beer <clears throat> it actually is a really a pretty damn solid beer actually so don't be scared of that but it's not it doesn't come across as conventional i'm going to say that to you right away um it's actually really like a kind of milkshakey type ipa um does it have lactose in it Apparently not. Mm. But yeah, this is a really unusual... I mean, all I can think of here is that Fierce have been using a kind of house yeast or something that they've, that they've developed because it really, it actually matches the aroma pretty well. Um, and when I think about some of the, the IPAs that I've had from these guys in recent times, you know, the the early shift and, uh, you know, was it late shift and night, the late shift, I think it was, um, it really is quite um, quite similar to those. And the, I think we had one recently that was just called Hazy IPA. Um, and they, they did have quite a kind of yeasty, almost farmhousey type presence to them. I mean, as I've said to you in previous reviews, I think when it comes to the sort of New England Hazy IPAs like this, you can get a few different direct, you get a few different directions that you can take these beers in. They can be more farmhousey and yeasty, sort of rye leaning and grainy. Wheaty and bitey, oaty and creamy, um, barley malt leaning and bready, or they can be a wee bit more kind of sweet and, you know, uh, just you know, sweet and brown sugary if you like. This one is just really weird. I've never had um, a, a hazy IPA quite like this one. Um, so yeah, and I would suspect if there's, if there's two things that are probably responsible for the flavour of this beer, it's quite likely to be cashmere and the yeast, and potentially some kind of interaction between cashmere and the yeast. Cashmere has this, I found in quite a few beers that have cashmere, cashmere can really play around with things like, you know, London Fog yeast and Verdant yeast and stuff like this. It can do some really, really unusual things and give you some really, you know, crackery, woody, farmhousey flavour. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's doing something in here. But let's break it down and actually describe the flavour properly for you and just see how we go. But this is a really pretty damn unusual beer, this one. Um, but the other, if you look at the ones, the other ones that they were doing in this series, there was things like a cinnamon paleo and stuff like that, which I have to say I didn't fancy. So wouldn't be surprised me if they are going for something a bit kind of funky and unusual here. But like I say, I do quite like this one. So it is almost like you get this big... The first impression of this is that you get this big, oaty, creamy, thick, malty backbone to it. But then it just gives you that sort of sweet thing that you get on the back end of Skittles. <laughs> it's so weird, this. It really is weird. But let's go through the beer kind of logically as we always do. So middle of your palate then, middle and back third of your palate, you can feel the backbone of the beer is a little bit of a bread crust. You get quite a big kind of thick, white bready thing coming out of this one which I do like it's 
So, I mean, on top of that, you can feel the wheaty character just thickening out the beer. Let's focus on the middle third of the palate for the moment. You can feel the wheaty character just thickening out the beer on top. So bread crust, the, the white bread from the barley malt, and on top of that, you get the um, the big kind of white bready wheat. Um, on top of all of that, down the kind of middle line of your tongue, you can feel the oats in there as well. And the oats thicken out the beer even further. This is definitely one of the most dense uh, beers in terms of malt backbone that I've come across. And it even it would even stand up to some of these um, these Danish uh, imperial stouts, the, the Nordic imperial stouts that I've had over the years. That's how thick and dense this thing is. And you would know if you've watched um, reviews from me before, these you know Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, Finnish, Icelandic stouts, those are hard to beat. But this has got to be the, the sort of thickest densest um new england that i've come across even though it's i compare it to those other beers but it's and it's at a different end of the taste spectrum but that's the level we're talking about here this is dense as hell but down that middle line of your tongue you can feel that smooth oatiness and you can feel the sort of dryness of the oats just creep out towards the edge of the the middle third of your palate but like i say on top of that you get this candied skittle flavor coming out of it which is really just weird <laughs> you don't normally expect that from a beer like this maybe in the dead center of your palate you get a wee tiny circle where there's a really concentrated brown sugary sort of thing like a mix of caramel and werther's original there's maybe a bit of that going on in this beer but otherwise it's like you've got oats and then you've got that skittle flavor actually and like i said earlier it kind of reminds me of the green skittle you know or maybe a mix of the green and yellow one So yeah, there is a really kind of unusual candied sort of thing to this. It's almost like they've they've put like pander violets or skittles or something like that in the fermenter with this beer and done something that way. And as I say, the only two things that come to mind would be something to do with one of the fierce yeasts and potentially the interaction with the cashmere. Because um, cashmere does weird things to yeast. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't think there's too much to say uh, about the middle third of your palate in this one. So let's focus on the back third of your palate. So border region between middle third and back third of your palate, you get a little bit of a kind of bready build up there, a wee bit more of a bread crusty thing. But then into the back third of your palate, you've got all the things we mentioned earlier, the bread crust, which is slightly grainier, the white bread, which again is slightly grainier, the wheat, which is a bit more bitey. You don't get too much of the oats going into that middle third of your palate but you do get a bit of that candied sort of thing and on the back third of your palate it is a little bit more like that sort of pander violety sort of thing but on top of all that you get the yeasty notes and you can feel the yeast it's a little bit farmhousey in a sense you get that sort of dry flowery character out of it you get a wee bit of that you know jacob's cream crackery sort of thing and just a kind of woody uh, element to it but the flavour on the back third of your palate is even kind of taller and it still gives you a similar density so when you start at the back of the beer you can feel the flavour is uh, you can feel the flavour is is this kind of high but then it goes down it doesn't condense all that much but like I say you've got a very tall flavour in the middle third of your palate but it feels dense as anything this is definitely I think this is the densest um, or the densest New England IP that I've had by quite some distance. So it's, it's impressive from that perspective. But the skittily candy note that you get out of this is just really, it's really weird. Um, having a 440 milliliter can of this is a bit, it's, it's a bit dangerous and it's a bit much actually. So this is a beer that you maybe want to have to share with, you know, like two friends or something like that. So yeah, this is the sort of one that you have like a wee uh, third of or something like that. If you go to the Fierce Bar, um, a 440 milliliter can of this is a bit mental, to be quite honest with you. Um, and it's, but it's not what I expected at all, actually. But let's focus on the hoppy side of the beer then and see how we go. So, hoppy side of things then is a little bit more what you'd expect. Um, as I've said before, New England IPAs rely on late addition and uh, dry hopping. Early addition hopping tends to be more West Coast IPAs, which has that in addition to the other two, but that means you don't get a lot of bitterness out of them. It's the early addition hops that give you the bitterness. Anyway, so in the back corners of the palate with this one, you do get a little bit of earthiness. 
as you move further forward, it does develop a little bit of a herbal quality, but then you've got quite a fresh floral aromaticity out of this one. Around the front curve of the palette, you do get a little bit of a lighter grassy quality. It's a little bit of a, a, a kind of um, zesty grassiness that you get out of this one, but it's also quite wet and fresh at the same time. Other than that, I don't think there's too much to say about the green component, but I think that sort of Skittles type flavour you're getting out of this one is contributing to that and just making it a wee bit more zesty. But let's focus on that front third of your palette and the fruity side of the beer then. So the border region between front third and middle third of your palette, again, you get a little bit of a bready build up in there, a bit of bread crust. Base of that front third of your palette is definitely like a sort of white bread and bread crusty thing. And then on top of that, you've got that nice juicy bubble where the, the fruit, where the, pardon me, the fruity esters roll the way out of the beer. And again, I think the cashmere is, is dominating this, to be honest with you. Um, and cashmere can have that effect. You have to be really careful with it, actually, when you use it in certain things. And to be honest, the only hops I've found that I would say it works really well with would be the likes of, you know, Motueka from New Zealand, which gives you the limey notes, um, Centennial, uh, which gives you a lot of lemon. And then, um, you know, I guess you could say um, Equinot as well. It can work fairly well with Citra, to be honest, too, because it has its own big zesty component. But yes, these kind of flavours you're getting out of this one. So let's break that down. Um, so straight away with this beer on the back of that front third of your palate, um, it's really interesting because there's a lot of that melony flavour and it's actually quite oily and quite zesty in a sense. But you can feel as you push further forward, there is maybe a little bit of pineapple coming out of this one as well. So you can feel a little bit of a sort of dried pineapple, you know, underneath but the whole fruity side of this beer is very very oily but as you push further forward into the front half of that front third of your tongue there is a, there is a good little bit of lime I don't know if I'd say lemon in this one there's maybe a teeny little bit of lemon zest just behind the front tip of the tongue but yeah a lot of melon a lot a, a little bit of pineapple in there and a lot of lime but you're getting quite um for me I'm not really getting the kind of mandarin oranges that much out of it that you would normally expect of the Azaka. There's maybe a little bit, a bit of it sitting on top, but yeah, melon at the back of the front third and a bit of pineapple kind of sitting underneath, but both the back half and the front half of that front third of your tongue are very oily and that's quite unusual from a mouthfeel perspective in this one. But yeah, melon dominates the cashmere just kind of takes over this beer to be quite honest with you. So it is a hop that you have to be very careful with. It's got a real pungency to it and I think it might be doing something with, uh, with the yeast in this case. So um, yeah, this it, it just gives you that impression of like a slightly, you do get a few flavors of like spicy apple, you know, green Skittles and things like that coming out of this beer, the further you go into the aftertaste. But uh, yeah, I like how this one goes about, but I like how it goes about its business in that sense. It's something really different. And you know, a lot of the beers that they were brewing for this kind of fifth um, anniversary, if you like, were pretty funky things like a cinnamon pale ale and stuff as I say so this is a really quite wacky and unusual New England triple IPA but other than that I don't think there's too much to say about the flavour we've been into it and we've analysed it quite a lot so it is really a kind of pretty unusual beer and for your fifth anniversary you want to do a few weird things so I'd be interested to hear their thoughts about what's going on with the brewing and stuff but it's I think cashmere is doing something weird in this and I've had really strange experiences with cashmere as a hop before. But let's round off this review with a mouthfeel then. So like I said, this is a... Um, it's definitely full-bodied. Carbonation is very smooth. It's actually quite oily, but at the same time it has this really thick, creamy character to it. So it's almost like a very thick milkshake IPA in a lot of ways. Um, carbonation, as we've said, is very smooth. When it comes to IBUs, I don't think this has got a lot to it. It's more, maybe it's maybe about 25, 20, 25 IBUs, but it's got a hell of a zesty hit to it. So in some ways it does give you something similar. But the malt base of this one is quite, um, it, the malt base of this one is just big, thick and dense. It's not overly sweet. Um, even the Skittle flavours just give you more of a zestiness rather than anything else the further you go into the aftertaste. But the fruits are quite oily and, and kind of citrusy, zesty leaning, to be honest with you. So, yeah, I think that kind of rounds up what this beer is all about. It's a really pretty, bloody weird New England triple IPA, really citrusy and zesty and everything. But 
I think we can lay the blame for that at the door of Kashmir. But uh, yeah, not a lot from the Azaka and the Brew 1 in this, to be honest. I would have expected a little bit more Mandarin, although you do get a bit of the pineapple that you would expect of Brew 1. But uh, yeah, interesting stuff. And one of the more unusual things I've seen Dugas put their names to as well. So um, yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this one. So this was the Emergency Haze, a 10% triple New England IPA from Fierce Beer, part of their fifth birthday release uh, in from Dice in Aberdeenshire here in Scotland in collaboration with Dugas Brigger from Landvetter next to Gothenburg over in Sweden. Uh, let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comments section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are, both from Fierce and from Dugas. We will no doubt return to both of these breweries at some point in the future. I do have a couple of other um, Fierce beers to work through, I think. More conventional beers for sure, actually. So I think we've got three or four of them to work our way through. So you'll see those at some point over the next little while. But in the meantime, let me know your own thoughts in the comments section below. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Check out my social media, check out their social media, and I'll see you guys very, very soon. The Emergency Haze from Fierce Beer, Dice, Aberdeenshire, Scotland, and Dugas Brigley and Landvetter near Gothenburg, Utebori on the Swedish West Coast. Happy fifth birthday to Fierce, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Slange it, scroll, and cheers.